I'm calling today the dwelling place or our dwelling place. Go to Psalm 27, please. Psalm 27, verse 4. Today might, as you're turning there, I just want to let you know, today might feel a bit like history class. We're going to, after this, we'll basically start in Exodus and we're going to end in Revelation. And I'll still get you out in time for lunch. I promise. Some people eat lunch at 4 p.m., so <laughs> that's a subjective term. <laughs> we don't. We have somewhere to go today. By the way, let me say this as you're turning. Psalm 27. Um, last night, we went to the, uh, it was a fundraiser for Avenue 941. I see Brenda and Phil here. It was awesome. Yep. Mary, Mary enjoyed it. It was excellent. I want to, again, I'm going to tell on Mary. Nobody, nobody saw. I saw something. We, they did a part in a song when they did, it was a night of worship where they were talking about God's goodness is running after me. And I happened to open my eyes and look and Mary's doing this. She's running. She's God's goodness. You were. You were. I saw it. <laughs> she was worshiping the Lord. Uh, Avenue 941 has a goal to try to raise $50,000 by the end of 2024, and that will help them with their, their, the next semester to get finished with what they've got to do. They don't charge for anything to have the students come and receive a uh, 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 tutoring and, and all of the things that they do for the Manatee County Schools. And so we gave a little last night. Uh, Exalt Church has given, and we, we're monthly supporters of Avenue 941. I'd encourage you, if you don't know anything about it, go talk to Brenda and Phil, and then uh, you can look up their website, look them up on Facebook. But if you guys uh, care about the young people in our community, there's a ministry that is reaching into the school system by the grace of God and is able to minister through academics and bring the word of God into the lives of these kids. And so if you uh, are able to, I'd encourage you, uh, sow a seed into that ministry and help them reach that goal for the end of the year. Amen? Are we good? Okay. Psalm 27, 4. Before we get there, let me read to you verse 1. This is David speaking. He says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? And then listen to this right here in verse 4. He says, One thing I have asked of the Lord that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. David said, this is the one desire that I've got above all else. He said, the one thing that I want, God, is to simply be in your presence. And I want to make it clear that David wrote this before the Holy Spirit was given to the earth. Amen? Jesus had to come and make an atonement for our sins. And he said, it's good that I go away so that I can send the helper, right? But this is a time when David said, I just long to be in the house of God. I want to be in the presence of God. The only way he could do that was to go into the temple where the presence of God was with the Ark of the Covenant. Now, we, in 2024, we have the Holy Spirit, amen? And we can get so wrapped up in all of our affairs and our life's uh, work and our goals and our troubles and all of the things that we have got going on and we can take advantage of and accidentally neglect the presence of God that is right here with us right now. Has anybody ever been guilty of that besides me? That it's so easy to neglect the Holy Spirit who is with us day in, day out. David even said in Psalm 139, he says, I can't get away from your presence at all. I, I've tried. He says, if I were to go to the deepest part of Sheol, I can't get away from you. If I were to climb the highest mountain, go up to the peaks of heaven, I can't escape your presence. Yet, that presence of the Spirit of God is easily neglected if we don't pay attention. Amen? And so when he's talking about, I want to remain in the presence of the Lord, I want to be in the house of God, 
That's him seeking to be in God's presence where God is. Now, I want to show you. We're going to start in Exodus 25, if you would turn there. I want to show you a history of the tabernacle and the presence of God. And I believe that the Lord is giving a word today that is going to show us these paradigms that are, that are, that are taking place through the tabernacle in the Old Testament and how we can apply that to our lives today and how we can operate in the presence of of God always. We can dwell in the presence of the Lord. So Exodus chapter 25, starting in verse one, I wanna read to you one through nine. It says, the Lord said to Moses, speak to the people of Israel that they take for me a contribution from every man whose heart moves him, you shall receive the contribution for me. And this is the contribution that you shall receive from them, gold, silver, and bronze, blue and purple, and scarlet yarns, fine twined linen, goat's hair, tanned ram skins, goat skins, acacia wood, oil for the lamps, spices for the anointing oil, and for the fragrant scents, uh, incense, onyx stones, stones for the setting, the ephod, and for the breast place, breast piece, and verse eight, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst exactly as I show you concerning the pattern of the tabernacle and all its furnishings, you shall make it. Now, this is the first mention of God dwelling among humans since Adam and Eve were, were commanded to leave the Garden of Eden. A lot's happened God has appeared to humans at different points between the Garden of Eden and now, but this is the first mention of God saying, make me a sanctuary, make me a tabernacle that I may dwell with my people. The Hebrew word for tabernacle is mishkan. That means dwelling place or habitation. In the Greek, it's skene, and that means the exact same thing. It's translated exactly the same. It's a dwelling place and a habitation or an abode. And sanctuary in the Hebrew is mikdash, and it's a sacred or holy place. So God is saying, make for me a sacred, meaning it's set apart. It's not, it's not the same as every other place. It's unique. It's special. It's sacred. Make me a holy place that I might dwell with my people. A place that's set apart from the rest of the world. Are you following? And then from chapter 25 through the end of 39 in Exodus, it's essentially concerning the, the, the you know, primarily the, the uh, plans for, the preparations for, and the construction of the tabernacle according to this design that God has given to Moses. So jump to Exodus 40 then. We're going to look at that. You can go, I, I will give you today a few things that I want you to go read on your own time. You could fill in the blanks and read those chapters. It's very enlightening about some of the details that God gives to Moses. But turn to chapter 40, verse 34. Once the tabernacle was completed, Moses prayed over it. He prayed over the people. They dedicated it. They brought everything into it. All the furnishings were there. And look at verse 34. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled on it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. See, once Moses and the people of God did what he had commanded them to exactly according to his commands, his presence was able to dwell with them, right, in that tabernacle. It was an extremely ornate, beautiful tent that would be mobile because they were in the wilderness, right? This was built and constructed while they were in the wilderness after they had been released from captivity in Egypt, before they got into the promised land. So a little bit of history with that is that it did exactly that. The tabernacle which housed the presence of God because it had the Ark of the Covenant inside of it, it traveled with the Israelites the entire 40 years that they wandered through the wilderness, right? Now, 
the Israelites, they were commanded in Exodus to keep an eye on the cloud, to watch. Because at any moment, if the cloud lifted off of the tabernacle, everybody was to quickly pack up everything that they have, pack up the tent of meetings, the tabernacle, and begin to move with the cloud. They were to follow the cloud. They were commanded to stay attentive and watch the presence of God. Now, I just want to play a little mind exercise with us for a moment. In our world today, we have so many distractions. We have so many things that draw our attention. And not even sinful things per se. It's just things that require attention. We have jobs. We have bills to pay. Things to fix on our houses. We have things that are very distracting to our lives, right? And you look at the time that the Israelites spent in the wilderness, and you could say, well, that was a judgment of the Lord? Maybe. But understand this. What a beautiful gift that they had no distraction. Food was given to them. It wasn't pleasant food necessarily, but it was provided for them, right? Water was provided for them. But they had no distraction except to stay focused on the presence of God. You would think, man, I don't wanna go through a wilderness season. But wouldn't that be wonderful if no distractions, you had everything removed, if God took away everything. You know, at one point, they had longed to go back to Egypt. Did you know that? The Israelites had said, it was better for us. We had fish and leeks and garlic, and we had all these things back in Egypt and slavery, God said, I've removed all of those things from you so you have the opportunity to focus on me and nothing else. That's actually a very beautiful gift of God, amen? So they did that for 40 years. They wandered through the desert. And they would watch if the cloud lifted. Okay, time to move, let's pack up. And then wherever the cloud went, they follow the cloud. And then when the cloud rested, they say, okay, this is where we camp. And they would set up the tabernacle with all of the tribes of Israel in a circle around them so that they all were focused on the presence of God. Then finally, after 40 years, the time came where they crossed over the Jordan into the land that God had promised them, right? That's a wonderful thing. But so many times in our own lives, when we get the thing that we wanted, when we get the promotion or we get the person we wanted or when we get the, the finances that we wanted, it's so easy then to take our attention off of the one who gave it to us, amen? We get the blessing, the promise, and then we just go, okay, thanks God, I got it from here. Well, what happened was when they got into the promised land, the tabernacle was erected and it stayed at Gilgal for about seven years while Joshua allotted the land out to all of the tribes. You know, they divided the land out. You're gonna be here, Manasseh's here. Jo you know, all of the different tribes were allotted their place. Now, after that time, Joshua decided, I wanna relocate the tabernacle to a more central location so that everybody in Israel would have roughly the same distance to travel there. So they found a city called Shiloh. That's where the tabernacle came to rest after seven years. So it was roughly the middle from east to west, north to south. And in Shiloh is where people would go to for their once a year day of atonement sacrifices, right? And this is where the tabernacle was. But in time, and remember, this is all relating to us, ladies and gentlemen, as Christians today. In time, they became complacent, Right? They began to adopt some of the practices of the culture around them. They began to mix and mingle idolatry of the Canaanites that they were supposed to uh, take over and destroy. So they became a little complacent. And in time, and you can read this in 1 Samuel 4 on your own, they ended up losing the ark. Because they went into battle against the Philistines and they lost the battle. They lost the battle because their hearts were not after God. So God didn't bless them in the battle. But they went back to camp and they said, why did we lose that battle? And then one of them got an idea. He said, I got it. We didn't have the ark of the Lord with us in battle. We need to bring the ark of the Lord with us and then surely we will win the battle. The problem is they were treating the ark of God like a lucky rabbit's foot. They weren't, they weren't seeking the holy presence of God. 
They were just wanting to use the ark, the physical contents of the ark, and say, well, if we've got that, everything is going to work out, but it didn't. Because God won't be used as a lucky rabbit's foot, right? God allowed them to be defeated by the Israelites, and he allowed the ark to be captured by the Philistines. Now, I want to show you this. David recalls this in Psalm 78, verses 60 and 61. He says, he, talking about God, he forsook his dwelling at Shiloh. Remember, we just said that. The tent where he dwelt among mankind and delivered his power to captivity, his glory to the hand of the foe. So the ark is now in the hands of the Philistines, the enemies who were the arch rivals of the, of the Israelites. You hear, if you study through the history, it's always uh, different people fighting against the Israelites, but it seems like the Philistines more than anybody else. So now they've got the ark of, God, the ark of the covenant, which represents the presence of God, but it doesn't work out too well for them. If you don't know the story, because of the presence of God in the hands of the Philistines, the Philistines begin to develop boils on their body and hemorrhoids. And because the, the same thing, the presence of God that can be a blessing to those who follow him and seek him can also be a cursing to those who are rebellious against him, right? We read this last week that the word of God is a sanctuary, but it's also a stumbling block, right? So this presence of God didn't go well for the Philistines, so they were like, get this thing out of here. We don't want this with us anymore. So they put it on a, ark, or on a cart with two cattle, and they send it back. And the, the, the ark being pulled by two cattle comes back to Israel, and it comes to rest at a place called Kiriath-Jerim, and it ends up staying there for 20 years. If you've ever seen the beginning of Lord of the Rings, anybody? Where they're, I don't remember which one it is. I know I got people in here that could tell me. I think it's the second one that where they kind of recount the history of the ring and how it had gotten lost and things that get misplaced and forgotten about for many years. Well, the ark sat at Kiriath-Jerim for 20 years, and guess what? You don't hear about the tabernacle anymore. The tabernacle that was in Shiloh, that was commanded by God to be made so that he could dwell among his people is just sort of forgotten about in Shiloh. You don't really hear about it anymore after this. Now the focus turns to the ark, and, the, and the, 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 the tabernacle is gone. And if you remember, when David became king, he said, I want to have the presence of God with me here in Jerusalem. That's awesome. That's great. So he commands, go get the ark from Kiriath-Jerim and bring it to me. So they go do it, and if you remember the story, they load it up on a cart with two ox, just like they saw the Philistines do. And a man named Uzzah died because of it. So David says, you know what, no, 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 we're not doing this. He goes and sticks it in a man's house named Obed-Edom, and it stays there for three months while David figures out how are we supposed to transport this thing. He figures it out, and he does eventually get the, uh, the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem. You can read about that in 2 Samuel chapter 7 on your own. You'll see that David goes to the Lord, and he says, God, it is not fair that I should get to live in a house made of cedar, this beautiful home while you don't have a resting place. And he says, God, I want to build you a house, which is good. But God's answer to him is, says, you know, I never asked for a house. You can read this. It's in 2 Samuel verse, uh, chapter 7. It's also in 1 Chronicles 28. Is the Lord says, you know, I appreciate that, David. He says, but, you know, I traveled in tents with the people of Israel for all those years throughout the wilderness, and never once have I ever asked for a house for myself. But the Lord grants it. He says, I'll let you build a house. But he says, I'll let a house be built. But he says, I'm not going to let you build it. He says, I'll let your son, Solomon, build it, right? And he says, you've got too much blood on your hands. He says, I'm going to have Solomon, your boy, build it. If you don't know, the name Solomon means, it's, it's the same as shalom or peace. He's a man of peace. Now, Solomon, and we're building up to a case here, okay? Solomon understands something. Go to 2 Chronicles 2. Solomon understands something because he, he says, okay, I'm gonna build this. My dad had it in his heart to build this. God told him no because he's got too much blood on his hands. I am now tasked with building a house for the God of the universe. Now look at what he says in 2 Chronicles 2, verses four through six. He says, behold, 
I am about to build a house for the name of the Lord my God and dedicate it to him for the burning of incense of sweet spices before him and for the regular arrangement of the showbread and for burnt offerings morning and evening on the Sabbaths, the new moons, the appointed feasts of Israel. Verse five. The house that I am to build will be great for our God is greater than all gods. But who is able to build him a house since heaven, even highest heaven, can't contain him. Who am I to build a house for him except as a place to make offerings before him? See that humility that Solomon says, what in the world are we doing? He says, God, I'm gonna build you the greatest house that I can with all of the natural resources that I've got. I will do the best that I can, but I know it is far inferior for the king of the universe He says, you created all of this, the gold, the silver, the wood, the hay, everything. Everything that we use came from you. And yet, we think we can house you? You are the God who created everything. He had such humility. He says, but I'm gonna do the best I can. When we look at our lives, we can look at God and say, God, there is no way that this mortal, sinful body There is no way that I can bring you the proper glory that you deserve. But I'm gonna do everything that I can, Father. I'm gonna do everything that is in my ability, with my strength, with my knowledge. I'm gonna give it all to you, Father. It's not gonna be enough, but I know you are good and faithful. And so I wanna show you this in 2 Chronicles 7 now. Go to 7. 2 Chronicles 7, verses one through three. As Solomon finished his prayer, Fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. And the priests could not enter the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled God's house. Now, this should remind you of what we just read that happened at the first tabernacle that was made by Moses, remember? Is that after the tabernacle was completed, God was satisfied. He says, I can dwell here. And where God is, man can't fix anything. Man, you can't outdo God. When the presence of the Lord was there, the priests couldn't even do their normal work. Why? Because their normal work is inferior to what the presence of God can do. Amen? Is that when we build this place, when we have this beautiful building, but when the presence of God is here, my preaching is far inferior. Our worship team is far inferior to just the presence of God moving in this house, amen? I would rather have the presence of God all day long than hearing me talk. You better say amen to that one. If you like my voice better than the voice of God, your priorities are off. That when we have the presence of God here, what are we to do? What can we even do? What are we gonna top the God of the universe? So, When the presence filled the house and the priests couldn't work, look at what verse three says. When the people of Israel saw the fire come down and the glory of the Lord on the temple, they bowed with their faces to the ground on the pavement and worshiped and gave thanks to the Lord, saying, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. When the presence of God is here, all you can do is just go, thank you, Lord. You can't improve on it. You can't have powerful dialect. and, and you, you, Paul says, I'm not coming to you in words, eloquent speech. He says, I'm coming to you in power, right? When the power of God moves, all you can do is just thank him and worship him. There's not much else that you've got to add to it, amen? So Solomon, he dedicates the temple. He prays over the people. And I want to show you verses, uh, same thing, 2 Chronicles 7, verses 12 through 16. Let me get a drink. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon in the night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. So even though, you know, if you were to go study this, you'll see that David said it was in my heart to build a house for the Lord. 
See, God commanded Moses to build him a tabernacle that he may dwell among his people. God didn't command David to do it. It was in David's heart. David just says, I want to do this. And God says, I'll permit it. And then at this point, God says, you know what? I like the heart of your son Solomon. I like the heart of this people, the, the sacrifice. I like the honor that you're giving to my presence. When we give honor to the presence of God, he's happy to dwell here, amen? When your life is a life that gives him honor, gives him reverence, and we don't mix and mingle with the world around us, when we are solidarity, uh, uh, our minds fixed on him, he says, I, I can dwell in that place. I can, I can reside there. <clears throat> Verse 13, when I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people. And we've been reading this verse for about the last 12 weeks. If my people, who are called by my name, humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayer that is made in this place. Now, I have chosen and consecrated this house that my name may be there forever. My eyes and my heart will be there for all time. God says, I choose this temple, this house that you have built for me. I choose it. I will listen to the prayers that are coming from there. The people that are, that are there in that, pre- in that house are not particularly special. They're not great. They're not mighty. They're sinful, fallen people, but because they have their eyes fixed on the Lord and they have dedicated this space to him, he says, I will listen to what happens there, right? I will focus on you. I will pay attention to you. I will let my presence be known in that temple. Now, he also goes on to warn, and we'll read this in a little bit. He goes on to warn that if you do not stay focused on me, he says, if you do not Keep your attention and your eyes on me. If you allow yourself to be mixed and mingled with the world like I have told you not to do, he says, I will remove you from this land. He says, I will remove my presence from this house. And sadly, Israel, because they're so prone to do this, as are we, they did take their eyes off the Lord. They did mix and mingle with the culture of idolatry around them, right? And God tried to warn them. God tried to say, don't go that way. He sent prophets. He sent Isaiah. He sent Amos. He sent uh, Jeremiah. He sent so many people to try to speak sense into the Israelites, but they would not listen. I want to show you that. Go to, you're still in 2 Chronicles. Go all the way to the end of chapter 36. 2 Chronicles 36. This is what it happens, sadly. Second Chronicles 36, verse 15, it says, The Lord, the God of their fathers, sent persistently to them by his messengers because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. Now, before we go any further, I'm a messenger of God. I'm a pastor. I speak the truth of the word of God. But I can tell you right now there are people who think that I'm a mean, judgmental, hate-mongering, right, bigot, Un, uncompassionate, but it's only because I'm speaking the truth of the word of God. If you speak the truth of the word of God in compassion because you love the world around you, we just read this on Wednesday night, that the world will slander you for that. It is not always received with open arms, right? But does that mean that we don't do it? Absolutely not. God even told Isaiah, he says, I'm sending you to a people that are dull of hearing and hard of heart. And he says, they will not listen to you, but I'm sending you anyways. Jeremiah cried to the Lord, and he says, these people don't listen to me, God. He says, if this is what it's gonna be like, just take me out now. It can be very difficult because sometimes the world around you won't listen to the word of God, but we are commanded by God to live it, walk it, share it, bring it, Amen? But listen to what it says. Let me read that again. The Lord, of the God their father, sent persistently to them by the messengers because he had compassion on the people and on his dwelling place. But they kept mocking the messengers of God, despising his words and scoffing at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord rose against his people until there was no remedy. 
Therefore, he brought up against them the king of the Chaldeans, who killed their young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary and had no compassion on young man or virgin, old man or aged. He gave them all into his hand and all the vessels of the house of God, great and small, and the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king and of his princes. And he, all these he brought to Babylon and they burned the house of God and broke down the wall of Jerusalem and burned all its palaces with fire and destroyed all its precious vessels. That's sobering. We read that last week when we were studying and we read in Daniel that was Nebuchadnezzar who came in and the Bible says that God gave Israel into his hands because of their persistent rebellion, amen? And he allowed the temple that he once said, I will inhabit this temple. I will let my name be there forever. And he said, Because you have rejected my prophets, you've rejected my messages, you've rejected my word, I'm removing my presence from this house now and I will allow it to be destroyed. So again, the Israelites find themselves in captivity just like they have many times before. This time there are 70 years in Babylonian captivity. Persia takes over. And a man named Cyrus, a king who uh, was led by the Lord, he was not a follower of Yahweh, but the Lord spoke to him, and he allowed them to go back and rebuild. So under the leadership of Ezra, the second temple was rebuilt. And this temple, it wasn't as big and as grand as the first one. It even says that when they finished the foundation, some of those who remembered the old temple cried because they said this one is not as good as the other one. But that second temple was built and it remained there for quite a while, several hundred years. That's the temple that was there when Jesus was on the scene. When you read about Jesus going into the temple to preach, right? When you hear about Jesus being left at the temple because his parents, when he was 12 years old, they forgot about him and they went back. That's this temple that was built under Ezra. That temple lasted for quite a while, but even that temple Jesus foretold it's gonna be destroyed. And in 70 AD, it was destroyed because the Romans were persecuting the Christian church. The first temple was destroyed because of the rebellion of the Israelites, not following the Lord and letting themselves fall into idolatry. The second one was destroyed because the people were seeking the Lord and the Romans were persecuting Christians. Sometimes bad things happen, amen? It might be because of your own doing. You might have put yourself in a situation. Or sometimes bad things just happen because bad people are around, right? And then there's a prophecy. We're almost to you and me. There's a prophecy. Well, there's several prophecies. Daniel talks about it. Ezekiel talks about it. Uh, Second Thessalonians talks about it. Revelation talks about it. That there is a third temple that will be built. And then it says that the Antichrist will seat himself in that temple and and claim that he is God. But even that temple will be destroyed one day. When Jesus comes, right, to the Mount of Olives, the Bible says that that heaven and earth will pass away. Everything will be destroyed. So even that temple will be destroyed. Every time, the tabernacle, the temples, none of these things last forever. But if you notice, the presence of God has never truly left. The presence of the Lord, the Spirit of God has always been here. He's had a remnant of people always throughout history. So what does that bring us to now with us, you and me? I'm gonna give you some rapid fire scripture. Are you ready? Some of them don't even try to turn to, but I want you to turn to John 1 right now. This is important. We gotta see this with our own eyes. John 1 Remember, the word tabernacle means dwelling place. Dwelling place, right? John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This is speaking about Jesus, right? Go over to verse 14. John 1, 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Do you see how 
The glory that was in Exodus 25 in the tabernacle, the glory that filled the temple, the glory that was in the second temple is now come in the form of Jesus to dwell among us. Amen? This is a direct fulfillment of Zechariah 2. He says that I will dwell in your midst. And then Matthew 1.23 is just awesome. Christmas is coming up. I love this verse. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us, right? Dwelling with us. All right, now go to John 14. Go to John 14. I told you, by the end of this, we're gonna be in Revelation. We will, we will. John chapter 14, go to verse 15. Here's the promise of Jesus for us today in 2024. John 14, 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments and I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the Holy or the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. Are you seeing the transition now? The tabernacle, a location, a tent that they had to camp around and keep their eyes on to know when he's moving and they could go into that place and make a, a sacrifice for themselves and the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies once a year to make sacrifice and atonement for the people, right? Then they got the temple that had the same sort of practices that people could go to and visit a physical location, then you have Jesus, who is the embodiment of the presence of God right here on earth with us. And then he says, there's a transition coming. He says, the presence of God through thy spirit has been with you, but in a few days, he's going to be in you. Look at this. 1 Corinthians 3.16, do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him, for God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. Look at this. Everything that I just said about the Old Testament temples, all of the regulations, they had to remain focused on the presence of God. When they allowed themselves to be mixed with the world, God said, I will remove my presence from that temple. I'm not going to let my presence dwell among people that confuse themselves with idolatry. All of these things, he says, if you will follow me, I will be there with you. But if you decide you're going to go the other way, I will remove my presence. But now you are this temple. Amen? I'm this temple. These same conditions apply to us. Now it gets even better because we're here together in a church. You see this? Look around. There are other people, right? Hopefully they love Jesus. 1 Peter 2.5. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. When we are together, we now create a spiritual house. Collectively, we are the temple of God. And I want to show you that in Ephesians 2. Go to Ephesians 2, verses 19 through 22. Ephesians 2. Verse 19, so then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple of the Lord. In him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. That's all of us, amen? That you, in your own individual personal life, house the Holy Spirit of God. And then when we join together as the church, and I don't mean exalt church, I just mean the church, amen? We have Resonate Life, City Life, we got Bayside, we got uh, Throne of Grace, we got all these churches around us. We are all followers of Jesus. We have the Spirit of God inside of us, amen? That means we, the church, we are the temple of God. But, remember last week I said, talked about confusing, mixing, mingling. 
2 Corinthians 6, 16. What agreement has the temple of God with idols? Remember, you're the temple of God now. The Holy Spirit dwells in you, right? What agreement does your temple have with idols? And you go, well, I don't have any idols. I don't have any statues. We went and I did a uh, tour at a spa here. I've never been to a spa before. Uh, it was a really cool place, but I probably won't ever go because I just don't go to spas. But I got to, I, with the Manatee Chamber of Commerce, I got to take a tour of this spa, and they were showing us through the rooms where they, had, they did, like, nails, and then they did, like, I don't know, skin treatments, and then they did, uh, I don't know, they had, like, rac- relaxation with, like, salt mist on you or something like that. And we turned the corner, and there was a big Hindu statue there, right, in the, in the middle of the spa. A lot of times when we talk about idols, we go, well, I don't have a big Hindu statue in my house. Yeah, but you got idols if you aren't careful. Amen. When you go, I can't come to church because I got football. Sorry, that's an idol. Right? When you, when, you, when you put anything above God, when you let anything take the place that only God should possess in your life, that is an idol. What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Amen? We are the temple of God. But you know your body ain't going to last forever, right? Teenagers, your body ain't going to last forever. Just ask somebody here over about 70. They'll tell you your body ain't going to last forever. We read Ecclesiastes uh, 12 when we were in the Bible study in there. Man, that's a hard chapter. If you're getting older and you're feeling the effects of it, you've got to read that chapter. And I don't know if you're rejoicing because you're coming closer to Jesus or weeping. I I don't know which it is. That's, go read Ecclesiastes 12. That's a hard chapter. Young people, read it because it'll sober you. You'll be like, oh, my good knees aren't going to last forever. We all, we, our temples are fading away. That's a reality. Our temples, this, this right here is not going to be here forever. This will eventually go back to the dust, right? But at that moment, I step into a whole nother temple. Look at this, Revelation 21, verse 22, it says, and I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb. We go from an exodus, a tent that God said, if you make this tent, I will dwell there among my people. To David saying, I want a permanent house for you. And God says, all right, I'll do it. And he dwells there among his people. To coming in the form of a man, Jesus, and dwelling among his people. To dwelling directly inside of his people. To we then will dwell directly in his presence for all eternity. Amen? That gives us something to look forward to and get excited about. That... These tabernacles are temporary. They are tents. They will not last forever. So what can man do to it? You got the election coming up. What is man gonna do, kill me? I always loved, I've said this many times here before, and I stole it from another preacher, but I always loved Paul's attitude. You know, whenever they would say, well, we're gonna arrest you and throw you in prison. He's like, great, I will sing until the walls fall apart. And they say, All right, we're gonna torture you. He says, I will count it all joy to suffer for the name of Christ. They say, fine, we'll kill you. To live is Christ, to die is gain. I mean, you can't hurt a man like that, amen? You can't rob his joy. What are you gonna do to him? Kill him, great. Torture him, good. Imprison him, I'll sing. We can have that kind of joy and that peace that no matter what, I'm the temple of God. And if I leave this temple, I'll be in his temple, which is him. I will be in his presence forever. Nobody can hurt me. But we got to look at a warning. We looked at it. We skipped over it. Go back to 2 Chronicles 7. Go all the way back to 2 Chronicles 7. God, after he says, I will dwell in this house, My ears will be attentive to the prayer that comes from this place. His ears are attentive to you because you have the Spirit of God. When you ask God, he hears you. Amen? 
He says that. I, I will listen to this house. Uh, the prayers that come from this temple, I will listen. My presence will be in this temple. But look at verse 17. And as for you, if you walk before me as David, your father, walked, doing according to all that I have commanded you and keeping my statutes and my rules, then I will establish your royal throne as I covenanted with David, your father, saying, you shall not lack a man to rule Israel. But if you turn aside, listen to this, if you turn aside, and this isn't judgmental, by the way. Can I just say this? If you're right now going, oh, here comes the part where they tell me what I can and can't do. No, this is the part that helps you know where the guide rails are so you know your best way to the presence of God. Amen? He says, but if you turn aside and forsake my statutes and my commandments that I have set before you and go and serve other gods and worship them, then I will pluck you up from the land that I have given you and this house that I have consecrated for my name, I will cast out of my sight and I will make it a proverb and a byword among all the people and at this house will be astonished uh, or, or which was exalted. Everybody passing by will be astonished and say, why has the Lord done thus to this house uh, to this land and this house. Then they will say, because they abandoned the Lord. Do you see that? Who abandoned who? It says, they abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers, who brought them out of the land of Egypt, who laid hold on other gods that, and worshiped them and served them, for he has brought this disaster on them. Listen. Ladies and gentlemen, if you are a Christian, if you are born again, if you are saved, if you have given your heart to Jesus, then this applies to you. He has rescued you out of Egypt, which is slavery, amen? He has rescued you out of bondage of sin and death, and he has consecrated you. He said that, I consecrate this house. He has consecrated you. But if those things are true, then the rest of this must be true. If we abandon God, you better watch out. Amen? If we begin to mix and mingle with the gods of this world, we, cannot, we can't trust that his presence will remain. We can't trust that he will continue to protect. When we abandon him, this temple becomes exposed and is susceptible to damage from the world. Amen? 2 Corinthians 6, 17, Therefore, go out from their midst. And be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing. Then I will welcome you. I'm going to get the band up here, please. I want to show you two more verses here, two more things. And, and, and we're going to worship the Lord. Um, and, and this is important. Please do me a favor. If you have to go, you have to go. I'm not going to judge you. I joke about the whole football thing. I don't really care. You do what you got to do. But I'm going to encourage you. Don't skip out on this. Don't, don't, don't leave if you can. Because this moment is, remember when we read that when the glory of God fell, so that the people saw the glory of the Lord, and they couldn't do anything but just thank him and worship him. That's it. Right? They couldn't improve on it. Going in and trying to sacrifice a goat in that moment really was kind of foolish, don't you think? Like, the presence of God is here. Let's go kill a lamb to atone for our sins. No, the presence of God is here. Amen? So I, I'm telling you right now, the presence of God is here. The presence of God is here. And we have all of these talk about these tabernacles and the current tabernacle, which is our body, and then the future tabernacle, which is the presence of God in heaven. All of these tabernacles have a piece of furniture in common, and it's an altar. All of them. If you look at the tabernacle, there was the bronze altar. The temple had a bronze altar. And in, even in heaven, there is an altar. Altars are typically the places of sacrifice, of prayer, of covenant, right? It's a place where God meets man, the, the altar. The altar that's in heaven, there's no sacrifice being done on that one because the sacrifice has already been made, amen? If you read in Revelations, it describes that altar is the prayer of the saints. 
It's just the prayers of the saints being cast on the altar in heaven. But we're not in heaven yet. We're here. We are the altar and we are the sacrifice. Let me read this to you. Romans 12, 1. It says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. It says, present yourself. You're the temple, you're the altar, and you're the sacrifice, and you just lay yourself down. And I want to remind you, and then we're going to read one more thing. I want to remind you what happened, that in both in the tabernacle and in the temple, when the, everything was completed and they laid the sacrifice on the altar, in both those instances, the glory of God came and consumed the sacrifice. Don't you want to be that sacrifice where the glory of God, the fire of God falls and consumes you and burns away everything unclean and purifies you and makes you holy and clean and new, Amen. We are the sacrifice. We should pray, God, consume me. Don't let me just continually go into the places that I go and do the things that I do. Father, I want you to consume me. Burn away everything unholy and make me pure. I want the Lord to consume me, you, this house. So can you stand up? And I want to worship the Lord. And I am believing in faith that he is going to sweep in and as he did in the Old Testament. And he is going to move and he's going to consume you. If you lay yourself on the altar as a sacrifice, he will consume you. He is faithful. His fire will burn away the dross, the sin, the darkness. He will burn that away because he has done it before. He's faithful to do it again. His word is true. He's not a man that he should lie. Amen? Hebrews 13, 15, it says, through him, through Christ. Look at this. This doesn't even mean you have to rely on your own strength. Because you might be here going, man, but I'm tired. I don't feel good. I don't, I, I'm, not, I'm not feeling it right now. Does it matter? He says, through him, through Jesus. Let us then continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. He has literally done everything for you. He has made a way. He's given the atonement. He's given the Holy Spirit. And then he even says, when you're not feeling it, offer a continuous sacrifice of praise through Christ. It's not even that is in your strength. Everything is in the strength and the power and the might of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, in your life right now. Amen? So I asked the band to do this song, and I, I'm asking you, this is still part of the service. This isn't the, the afterthought. This isn't the part of the service that, that we just go, well, he's done yapping at us. Now we go to lunch. This is part of you sealing the deal. Now, this is you. I have said all I can say, and I'm just a man. I'm not even that good at this. But God, the Holy Spirit, he says, I will work. So let's now seal the deal between you and God. Lay yourself on this altar and let him consume you in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for your presence. Thank you for your grace, for your love and your power. Father, we can leave this building of concrete and wood and paint, drywall, with a bold confidence because we're not leaving your presence when we leave here, God. We carry your presence, God. We carry your presence. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. Father, I pray that we leave this building that may not even be here in years to come. We don't even know what will happen. Father, this building is nothing more than a gathering place for us to get reinvigorated and to be reminded of who you are in us so that we can go out into the world carrying your presence to everyone around us, Father. I ask you to bless every person here in this place, every person watching online, that you would fill them, Holy Spirit. Give them your power and your joy, your peace, your grace, your love, your mercy, 
I pray you would move through them as they go to wherever they go today. And you would fill them and operate through them as they are your holy temple. In Jesus' name. Amen? Show the world who Jesus is. Amen. So go out. Enjoy this day. We will be back here at 5 o'clock for prayer. And I hope to see you all then. I love y'all.